टुडे वी हैव गैदर्ड हियर टू वर्शिप श्री कृष्णाज इन कार्नेशन As you know that Shri Krishna is the incarnation of Narayana, of Shri Vishnu. So, in every incarnation, they carry all their qualities, all their powers, and all their nature with them. So, when he incarnated, he had all the qualities of Narayana. and then that of rama but every incarnation tries to rectify whatever in their previous life has been misunderstood and have been carried to the extremes that's why they have to come back again and again it's too hot for me i think can you not put it out it's too hot <clears throat> All right. So, as Sri Vishnu, when he thought of taking his incarnation, because he is the one who is the preserver, is the preserver. of this creation and also the preserver of dharma so when he took his incarnation he had to see that people keep to their dharma by keeping the dharma all right only you could get your realization so the job <laughs> was quite difficult for i should say to keep people in the central path of mahalakshmi so by first incarnation we can say that he tried to create a benevolent king as sri ram socrates has described a benevolent king but as a result of that people started thinking if they have become king and queen born in the family of royalty then they are gods sri ram was the purushottam means he was the best among all the human beings that means he incarnated as a human being total human being showing all the qualities of human beings like he was he married the lakshmi principle that was sita and then also he lived a normal married life when he gave her up he lived like an ascetic to show how a man should lead his life in a proper dharma as a married man and even when the wife has gone away how he was leading a life of complete chastity and he never had another marriage so many people said that you should have another marriage so the system that was the best to have a monogamy he followed it by his life he showed how a husband should be with his wife but then later on he had another role as the king when he became the king then he found out that people were criticizing him because he brought sita back from ravana so shri rama 
decided to send her away from him. How many people in this world who are in power would be that sensible about that power that they have, that they have to behave in a manner that they should be ideals for all other people who are working under them for the administration, for looking after the country. But Sita Ji also, because she was also Mahalakshmi, she understood everything, the whole play, and she went away. And then Sri Rama also taught how to rule the people. So they say the most ideal kingdom was Rama Raj. When Rama ruled this world, there was peace, no competitions, everyone was joyous and happy because he was the one who was emitting fair play and dharma, joy, bliss and peace. So there was no need to have any struggle, no competition, no fighting, nothing. So this benevolent king came as a incarnation to show us how a king should be. And he led a life of a serious type, very dedicated and serious type of life, how a benevolent king should be. <coughs> As a result of his incarnation, always people take to something, uh, something which is not normal. So because he lived as an ascetic. People started following asceticism. We'll not marry, we'll not have our wives, we'll live like Rama, all these things they started. So asceticism grew up. Before that, before Sri Rama, all the saints used to marry, they used to have wives, they used to have children. They lived a very normal life. Only they were saints because they were very highly evolved people and they lived in ashrams, doing the work of realization and also other corrections in human beings. Now, when Sri Rama came, people thought that he was Sri Rama, so let us be like him. Because he lived like an ascetic, let us also live like an ascetic. So this foolish idea of asceticism crawled in and then people became very uh, austere type, very austere. Nobody would laugh, nobody would smile, everything was very serious, absolutely, and everything was done in a very dry manner. <coughs> so many uh, seekers did not marry. But apart from seekers, many seers and saints also did not marry. And because they had no balance, because marriage gives you a balance, they became very dry people, very hot-tempered people. And we have examples of some rishis who are known for their hot temper and their ascetic qualities by which they could uh, destroy anyone, make them into ashes. In Sanskrit, called a bhasma karoti. So these qualities developed. That is the time Sri Krishna came back from Sri Rama's incarnation. He came back as Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna's incarnation came to show that this whole creation is fun is Leela. That's why he's Leela Dhara. It's called as Leela Dhara. He was the one who showed that everything is fun. There's nothing to be serious, nothing to be uh, dry, nothing to be ascetic, but the whole life is a fun. He gave this idea because people had become so austere. 
And then also a kind of a funny Brahminism started, like uh, they would not eat, they created a caste system, we started developing. The caste was determined by birth, which was wrong, and uh, they could not eat food. Then the Brahminism started growing up quite strong, and these Brahmins started dominating others. So Sri Krishna came, and He came as the son of a uh, whatever, milk, milkman, M- milk, uh, milkman, huh? Cow? Cow hurt? Cow hurt? But a guale killer. Milkman's son. But they were rich milkmen, very rich milkmen. Now, that is the time, you see, the whole play was brought forth. And the play was quite cruel, I should say, because one horrible devil, Rakshasa, some or other used a, bo- a lady who was Kamsa Chiai, mother of Kamsa. And she is the mother also of, she, we can say the grandmother of Sri Krishna. So she had a son who was also a Rakshasa. So it's all a play of the same. So he had an uncle who was a devil, who was a Rakshasa. And he was supposed to kill this uncle. See the play, this is a drama, or just see the drama as I worked it out. He was supposed to kill this uncle who was very powerful and who was a devil. So in his childhood, he used to play. He used to play with uh, milkmaids and with other ladies. He was very young, he was about five years of age, and he did all kinds of pranks and he did all kinds of uh, uh, leelas, like he killed one snake, very big snake, a cobra, very well known uh, cobra, and also he killed many Rakshasas and Rakshasinis with his power. In a play. It's just in a play used to do it. And you must have read the stories about him. How he showed that there is no need to have a big army of people as Sri Rama had. He didn't use any monkeys or anyone. Though Hanumana was always was sitting on his uh, chariot, but he never used all these outside powers. Only whatever uh, he had the weapons that he used to show that there is no need to use any army or uh, other people to kill a Rakshasa. And all was in a very playful manner. At the time of Sri Rama, he was not supposed to know that he was an incarnation. But it was reflected to him by various methods that he was an incarnation. And still he would not accept it because he was not supposed to know. It's something like Mahamaya. But say, all the cameras are now giving you all the evidence of the real uh, Mahamaya, what she is like. But one may try to show that you don't remember, you don't have, you, you have no memory of it. Because if you remember it, then your action would not be human, they would become divine actions and that may be not all right for human beings because they won't be able to stand or they'll be frightened, there'll be such an awe. So Sri Krishna normally behaved uh, like a very ordinary person. Like in his childhood, he was very fond of butter 
And as you know, butter is very good for the throat. For Vishuddhi, I have told you many times that on your tea you put some butter and take it, so that your throat, which is dried out, will feel better. So he was very fond of butter and he would go and make his friends help him, I made a pyramid out of them, would climb up and break the butter container and would eat all that butter like a little baby. So one day his mother said, all right, why did you eat butter? He said, I never ate. He said, then what is this on your mouth? He said, this is all these boys have put it on my mouth. You see, to him even telling such little, little lies also was a fun with the mother, to that extent. Like, don't tell lies, you must not. No, there was no fun in this kind of thing. So he told her a lie. See now, these people have put it on my mouth, they have eaten all the butter, and now I am the one you are catching. <laughs> so she said, really? Now open your mouth. So he opened his mouth. And there she saw all this in the mouth, the whole universe moving in the Vishuddhi, the complete Vishuddhi chakra. She saw and she just bowed to him. Then he says, why are you going to me? As if nothing has happened. So, see, all his pranks and all his uh, childish, sweet lies were just to create a feeling of understanding. And it's regarded as something very sweet according to the Indians, or we can say according to the Eastern ideas, that children are naughty like that with the mother. They all enjoy the naughtiness of the children, little naughtiness here, naughtiness there. And the strictness of children to a great extent also is there because I think uh, people are not attached to their children, they don't love their children, they love their carpets, love everything else, because they can sell it, but they can't sell their children. And that kills the joy. So the children and the parents are separated by materialistic ideas, that this material is more important than their own children. So in his childhood he has shown lots of pranks and lot of things and the way he used to steal also. Now stealing is supposed to be bad. Some belongs to somebody else, if you steal is bad. But he was stealing only the butter of his mother that he had made them. And he used to steal the butter of all the ladies who used to take down to uh, Mathura where Kansa was ruling. And this butter was eaten by all the Rakshasas there and they were becoming very powerful. So he thought best thing is to go and eat all the butter so that these ladies won't be able to go and sell it. Also, if you see it significantly, it is that we starve our children, we starve our families just to have some money. The money orientation is there, that you can go and sell your butter to somebody. With uh, this idea of everything to be sold out, we have to sell out this, we have to sell out that, nothing is going to be kept with ourselves. So, the children are the only permanent liabilities. So the children are treated as if they are just burdens, while all the other things are good because you can sell it. So the whole value system, if it turns down to money, then children have no place in the family. According to Sahaja Yoga, children are more important than all the wealth of the world and they are to be looked after that way. Of course, they should be told what is dignity is, how to behave themselves. But their little, little pranks are to be understood and enjoyed because only as children they can do pranks, not as grown-ups. So they should have that much freedom to play pranks and to play some tricks on you. Otherwise, they'll become very serious people and might become ascetic. Those parents who are very strict, their children are never normal. They either 
are extremely uh, perverse, rebellious, or they are quieter and they cannot uh, face life. So both are of the same style because one cannot face life, another cannot be faced by life. It's like this. Nobody can face such people. So you have to treat your children with great love and understanding, but they should know if they misbehave, then this love will be finished. So children only care for love. They don't know money, they don't know anything. So the love that is you establish in your child becomes very precious thing. So the system of Sahaja Yoga is based on divine love and it can only work when people are loving. If they love money, if they love power, if they love their reputation, they love this, love that, and not their own children or their families, then they are absolutely losing a very big part of the society and God knows what is going to happen to these children if you do not have love for your children. In Sri Krishna's life you can see various things he has shown. In his, we can say in his epic or in his uh, biography, if you see, uh, you will find how many facets of life he has handled with such beauty. Then in his childhood, then he goes and kills the devil of Kansa. That too, how beautifully he does it, how he kills the people who are surrounding him, how he knows their secrets, how they can be killed, it shows complete brilliance and very beautiful organizing uh, the whole thing. Now imagine one Krishna fought, one Krishna fought the whole army of that Kansa. How he must have done it? Because after all he is Virat and the, all the powers that are of this all-pervading power are in his hands. He can do whatever he likes, he can play around as he likes, he can, uh, he can finish off anybody he wants and it is so easy for him to manage uh, all these things simultaneously. Then came his life when he became the king. When he became the king, he wanted, I should say in a way that he wanted to establish people in dharma and he needed the help of the five elements. So he ma made them into five ladies whom he married, so he has five wives. But there are five elements, part and parcel of his being. But he was Yogeshwara, absolutely detached in his yoga. But he had, for practical purposes we can say, five wives. And there were sixteen thousand women who became his wives. These sixteen thousand women are nothing but his sixteen thousand powers, because you know his uh, chakras are, they have got sixteen petals. And these sixteen petals multiplied by the viratas, one thousand petals each. So it comes to sixteen thousand powers. So these sixteen thousand powers were incarnated as women, were taken away by some horrible king, and he went there, fought that king and brought these ladies. Now, even now it is so that an, even an old man has a young lady with him, people will never think that there is good relationship, they'll always think there must be something wrong. So he had to marry them because he had to keep these ladies, so he married them. But mother's position is different because mother can have thousand children, but poor man, even if he has one woman round him, everybody will say he's a bad person. So he had to marry all of them, so-called marriage, and these sixteen thousand powers stayed with him by which he established our Vishuddhi Chakra. Now when we have our Vishuddhi problems, we have to know what are the deities on both the sides and what were their qualities which are lacking in us, that's why we are we are suffering. Let's see the right side, we should see when we catch. 
श्री कृष्णाज इसेंस इज स्वीटनेस माधुर्य माधुर्य एंड इज पावर वॉज राधा राय इज एनर्जी धाम इज द वन हु हैज सस्टेन द एनर्जी एंड हर पावर वॉज शी वॉज कॉल्ड एज आल्लाद आल्लाद मीन्स जॉय गिविंग क्वालिटीज शी है सो श्री कृष्णाज क्वालिटीज वेर दैट ही वॉज योगेश्वरा सो ही वॉज द विटनेस एंड स्वीटनेस now a person who shouts and screams and talks loudly and loses his temper in a very loud voice or who speaks very loudly all the time they all suffer from the right vision so one should understand that even when you have to scold somebody you have to just say what are you doing why are you doing like this otherwise Why did you oh like this? Finished. Right, we should go over. It's finished now. So for the right, we should be use the mantra of Vithala and Rakhumai. These two persons. You see, it is very significant that also, because they say that there was a Pundari Kaksh, one boy who was serving his parents, and his parents were sleeping. He was pressing their feet. When Vithala and his power Rakhumai. Rukmini, they appeared in the door, but he said, "Now keep quiet. My parents are sleeping, so you stay there." So he had one brick near him, which he threw, and asked them, "You stay on that." So they kept quiet. They kept quiet because they are sleeping. Now this is the thing: is on the right side, if you are talking loudly. If you talk too much, uh, if you uh, intimidate people with your talking, then you catch on right with it. So for that, best is to take some rest and give some rest to your right with it by stopping your talk. Go into mauna. They said, just don't talk. For some time, if you don't talk, you will see that your right with it will be improved. Your problems will be improved. So, as it is the right side, what happens is that the heat starts coming from the stomach. It's all in one play. The from the we can say not from the stomach, but actually from the liver. The heat starts rising. It first goes into right heart. As a result, you might become a very hot-tempered husband or a father or something. You might get asthma. Anything with that right heart. Then it passes on to your right vishuddhi. When it goes to your right vishuddhi, then you become a very irritable, hot-tempered person. All the time you shout at someone. Nobody can talk to you. If somebody has to talk to you, he has to use a barge pole in between. God knows what time he'll shout at you. Or maybe I have seen many women lose their hearing, or men lose their hearing when there is somebody who is shouting at them. So shouting is a very bad thing for others. And also for yourself, because of course your vishuddhi goes out. After some time, so your voice goes out. After some time, you cannot talk, and sometimes they have to just keep quiet. But for others, it's even worse, because if you use your uh, anger in that manner, then that person might be just frightened of you, might develop inferiority complex, might become a left-sided person. Uh, might catch some boots. Uh, God knows what can happen to a person who has somebody all the time shouting at. But the worst physical thing could be that she can become deaf. So, from Sri Krishna's life, one has to learn that how he would just play his flute, and the whole atmosphere used to become absolutely quiet, without any ripple of. Any trouble, any idea of disturbance, just peaceful. But in modern times, the other way round. They have the music where the right vishuddhi is about to break or burst. I don't know what sort of a music it is. When they listen to this music, see, then it excites. Then it excites you. 
It doesn't make you peaceful, it excites you, excites you more and more. But as Sri Krishna becomes Virata, your limbic area also gets numbed with it. And when this shouting music is too much, then they have to use loudspeakers and shout much more. Then they have to put something near the ear to hear something. Otherwise they have no excitement. All the exciting, uh, we can say, all the exciting uh, uh, cells become numbed. And you have to really go in for tremendous effort to create that excitement in those numbed cells. So it's very dangerous throughout. If you see that it starts from the liver, goes to the uh, right heart, then to Vishuddhi and then in the brain. So then you take to drugs because your brain is numbed out. So you take to drugs and when you take to drugs uh, then you feel that you are all right. Then again you feel that this drug is not sufficient, then you take stronger drugs, then you take more drugs, it goes on one after another. Ultimately it reaches a stage when you are nowhere. <clears throat> so it is all self-destruct. I am also using my right Vishuddhi too much. <laughs> you have to learn to have mauna, means science. Those who think, who are very dominating, who are talking in a very dominating manner, whose right Vishuddhi is catching, should become silent and should, at least for some time, should not talk at all. Maybe you might fix one day, say you can do it on a... say, I'll not talk on Monday. But supposing Monday you have to work, so you should say, I'll not talk on Sunday. But human beings are such that if they decide they will not talk on Sunday, then Sunday they'll talk the most. And this shouting and then intimidating people, you have no right. You have no business to shout at anyone whatsoever. What is the need to shout? After all, you are a human being, another one is a human being. God has not given anybody, whether it is a husband, wife, children or anyone, but I find this as even children shout, the mother shouts, the father shouts, if you go in the house, feel like running back because you'll find here nothing but shouts. So this, this kind of a family system will rock, completely finish that family and there will be no beautiful relationship between each other and between the other people. Sometimes so we can say the whole country is having nothing but shouting at one and shouting at another. All over you go, you find nothing but shouting. Even if you take your car a little bit this side, there will be a shouting. The slight, I mean, for the slightest excuse, they start shouting and spoiling their right to shoot them. Now, for politicians, the thing is the best way to shout because they can really impress people by their shouts. So they shout a lot, tell people this, that, when they speak you should hear, there's no sweetness in their tongue, nothing of the kind, but they shout and by shouting a person gets frightened, all right, you want the vote, we'll give you, but don't shout. That's how many people get elected and become big and think that they are very successful because they have been shouting. Then they have training for shouting and they go in for a higher and higher education in shouting how to shout, how to, how to uh, intimidate people by the loud voices. For Sahaja Yogis it doesn't behold. Sahaja Yogi has to be a very sweet person to talk, extremely sweet. Now, when you are thinking of, say, Sri Rama as a person, uh, who was the king, and then you have got Sri Krishna, who was a diplomat. 
So what is the divine diplomacy? You don't have to shout, but you change the subject. If you want to bring somebody to a some conclusion, the best thing is first to change the subject. And gradually, if you are clever enough, then you go on changing, changing, and you bring it back to the right thing. That's the clever thing to do. Otherwise, just by shouting, if somebody might say, yes, all right, I'll do it, by the time you are gone, he'll say, yeah, I'll do it. That means something else. So, you see, he might say yes and yeah, uh, any time. So to have a complete rapport with another person is to play with that person. That's what I did also in Russia. I went round and round and round and round and brought him to the point that we have to be very independent thing, and I managed it. That is Sri Krishna style. You see, because to face it, supposing somebody says, oh, this is the, my idea, I've decided to do this and that, and everything, then you should say slowly, all right, now I would say what you are saying is correct, absolutely correct, I agree with you. And what do you think about the other thing, something like that? And then you should say, now, I can suggest, but I would like to suggest like this. Uh, if you can, I agree to it. See, gradually if you go and talk like this, things can work out and people will feel really uh, that you have taken time and you have spent that much time and have uh, accepted uh, the proposal and things. And then don't, don't feel bad. So one has to know that what is the essence of all this diplomacy. Can you tell me? What is the essence of this diplomacy? It's benevolence. You have to achieve the benevolence of the whole humanity. This is the essence of it. If you are doing it, you are not doing for yourself, for your gain, you are not doing for the gain of any particular person, but you are doing it for the benevolence of the whole humanity. So once you know this is the essence, so what is the need to shout? By shouting you are not going to achieve anything. So to play around with it and bring it to that point which is benevolence, like Krishna was asked that you said that you have to tell the truth and it has to be also very pleasing. Satyam vadet, priyam vadet. He said, how can it be? These two things cannot be. Supposing you tell the truth, people may not like it, may not please that person. So he said, no, it should be satyam vadet, hitam vadet, priyam vadet, that tell the truth, Tell for the benevolence and tell the pleasing thing. Supposing you tell somebody the truth, he may not like that at that time. Supposing you tell that person, now don't go today by plane, he will not like it. What do you mean? I'm going to go. No, please don't go, I request you. Then he finds out that day the plane went and had a crash. So he thinks this was good because for my benevolence this is a worked out, so this is something so good. So immediately he feels obliged to you and he thinks we have to have told him the truth by which it was his benevolence and that's why he's pleased. So in the long run, if you talk something for the benevolence of a person, but benevolence of the Spirit, then such a person immediately thinks that we have really done such a great obligation on him, that you have saved him. If even you have to tell some lies for the benevolence, it does not matter, it will not have any effect. Because Sri Krishna, which is the deity, knows it. For example, a man is coming to kill somebody and you know where that man is hiding. He comes and asks you, 
Where is that man? Are you supposed to tell him the truth? All right, he's there, go and kill him. No. So what do you have to tell? You have to tell him that, see, I'm not going to tell you, I don't know, doesn't matter. Because what he's asking is unauthorized, is anadhikar. He had no business, he has no authority to ask such a question. And he has no authority to extract the answer from him. Whether you give him the answer or not answer is your right. So if you understand that it is not for the benevolence of the man who wants to kill, because tomorrow he will be hanged, and not also for the benevolence of the person whom he is seeking out. So if you do like that, then there is no problem. You will find most of the people will just like you because you, they will know that you are sincere, very honest, that you want to be benevolent. Now, as you know, I have told all of you everything, whatever I felt like about you. Most of the time, I should say, not all the time, but of course, most of the time. I have to also tell lies a little bit. Uh, but whatever I do, you will find out, is for your benevolence, is for your good. I have to tell you, I cannot run away from that. I have to face it. So you cannot run away from telling people what you think is right for them, especially those who, about whom you are in charge, like you have children, you've got a family, you've got other relations, of whom you are in charge, then best thing is that you have to tell them frankly what you think, uh, what is right, is your duty. Then people escape it also. Many people who don't want to face their children, I have seen, they'll give them toys, toys after toys. They would not like to face their children, tell them, no, I don't like it, it's not good, I would like you to do like this and this. So discipline doesn't mean, discipline doesn't mean something very dominating of one person or two persons, but discipline means that whatever we do has to be for the benevolence of your spirit and the spirit of others. That is what is the Sahaj discipline, where you do everything for the benevolence of others and for the benevolence of your own ascent. Once you have established this idea of hita, of this benevolence, you have known the life of Christ, life of Muhammad, life of all these great people, because what they have done is for the benevolence of the people. So I would say now we have the left Vishuddhi and you know very well that left Vishuddhi is the lightning, in the lightning. Now what is lightning? He just shouts and roars. So a person who has got left Vishuddhi should actually become a person who can shout and who can scream and who can uh, I should say, expose others, as she did, in the same way you have to do it. And that you should not be afraid, you should not worry, and you should not think, how can I do it, after all. But mostly the people who feel guilty are a type which has lost its uh, confidence and the ego has entered into the left side. It's a very complicated situation. So we have to be on the lookout that we are not feeling guilty, it's very important guilty for this, guilty for that. It's just a myth, we want to escape reality, that's why we say we are guilty. So you have to face, face it, your reality. Try to find out what's wrong with you and what's wrong with another person and face it. That is much better than to just say, oh, I feel very guilty and sitting down. Because Vishnu Maya is nothing but like an electricity. And electricity exposes people, she screams at people, shouts at people, she roars at people. So if you have a left Vishuddhi, then you have to use these methods. I would say a person who has an inferiority complex should go to the sea and address the shoe. See, and tell, I am the Lord of the sea, I am this, I am that, loudly. Those people who cannot speak on the stage, 
cannot come on the stage. They should go also, same way if they try, they'll become great speakers. It will be a very good idea for you to go and just give a big lecture. And with that big lecture, you can always pani You can always uh, show that you are not suffering from any inferiority complex, but you are expressing yourself in a clear-cut way. So, now you will see the power of Shri Krishna is of the throat of the right side, where what is the power He has got? The power is that His sweetness. He has the power of the shouting, or you can say with which you vocal cord, you can call it. He is the power of the vocal cord, but how does He use His power? Is for sweetness. It's a contrast. And the same thing happens with Vishnu Maya too. Now Vishnu Maya is the potential power in the, say, in the clouds, is a potential one. But what she does is to scream, shout and show her existence that she exists. Now all these photographs that you get and all these miraculous photographs you have been showing me are because of Vishnu Maya. She is the one, as electricity, she acts. And she is the one who manages all these things very well. So though she is the sister of Sri Krishna, she is in a way very much subtler because she helps you in such a subtle manner. Now this mic, it has electricity in it. You'll be surprised my vibrations are passing through this. It is bombarding this. And from here they are going anywhere you want them to go. You can put a computer on the other side and you can computerize me. It is such a remarkable thing that the one which is supposed to shout, scream and roar is the one which is on the left-hand side so that it exists in the people, in a potential way, in the people who are feeling guilty, who are suffering from inferiority complex, who are sly, who feel they are good for nothing. She exists in them. See the contrast again. She exists in them that her power, she exists in a person or expresses in a person who is not self-confident. And then she asserts her power by which persons become self-confident. This is how her working comes in and that is potentially within us also. So when we talk of Vishnu Maya, we have to know that she's sitting down there. Any moment we decide, we can become great speakers, we can expose people, we'll be like lightning, we can roar, but normally we are not. So it gives balance to both sides of people. But in the center, when you rise, when the Kundalini rises, most of the people have their Vishuddhi got up, most of the people. So they have to either see that they are not guilty or they have to see that there is no shouting, nothing, they are not aggressive in their shouts and plus they have to see that they are completely in balance with themselves. So they are in the central path by which they become sweet, kind and nice. Now there are many people who artificially become sweet, artificial. If they have to take out some money, so they'll be extremely sweet and nice. Such people are really going to go to hell because they are using the power of Sri Krishna in a very absurd manner and for that they cannot be spared. So those who are artificially sweet are good for nothing. You have to be really sweet and kind if you think of Him as one who is uh, Narayana, who is Sri Rama, who is Sri Krishna and who is the Lord of your Vishuddhi. So we have to control not to feel guilty again, because there might be some people 
who might be feeling that mother is saying to me. I'm not saying to anyone as such. It's a general talk. So what I'm saying, if you are a person who is a shouting tap, please bring it round and keep it in check and take rest, give rest to your throat. Some people are very happy if they are told that today collector saab is in rest. They said permanently or for a short time. Because he's the one, if he's a shouting fellow, nobody wants to see him. No one likes any person who shouts, no one likes. Even the nearest and dearest don't like it. Of course they tolerate, it's different, but they don't like it, they don't want it. So for us it is important to understand that our Vishuddhi is to be kept clear. First of all, we must have a beautiful heart, a very clean heart, where there's a fragrance of Sri Krishna's uh, melodious music. Unless and until we have a beautiful, sweet music in our heart, we can never be, never be good sajogis. My hope today's evening puja, though has been rather late, doesn't matter, uh, will help you to think about it, improving your Vishuddhi, working it out, and then to look at the Bharat and find out what's wrong with you. Get it corrected, which can be done by anyone, and see that you just have a full idea about yourself, about your Vishuddhi. And that's only possible, only again it's a vicious circle, if you have a good Vishuddhi. If you don't have a good Vishuddhi, you can never see yourself, because at the Vishuddhi point only you become the witness. You are just a witness when you are at a Vishuddhi point. So you have to be at the Vishuddhi a witness. If you have achieved the witness nature, then you can see in your Vishuddhi what's wrong with you, what's wrong with your problems, with your atmosphere, everything, and you will end up here only, thinking, oh, this is the one that is wrong. So today, when we are worshipping Sri Krishna, we should know that our Vishuddhi and our brain, because ultimately he becomes the brain. Sri Krishna becomes the brain. That's what I told you, that the fat of the stomach goes in the brain. So Sri Narayana go, enters into the brain and, brain and becomes what we call as Virat, Akbar. And when he becomes Akbar, then he is the brain in the big macrocosm. He is the brain. So people who worship Sri Krishna become brainy people without ego. Their brain develops and they have no ego about it. Egoless intelligence, which I call as the pure, pure intelligence, starts manifesting. May God bless you all. Uh, after this puja now, you know that I'm going to Finland and you should see my itinerary is terrible and from Finland to Moscow, Moscow to India, India to Japan, and Japan to Los Angeles, and Los Angeles to uh, New Zealand, New Zealand to Australia. <laughs> so this will be like this every day practically, I think. But whatever it is, I'm going now, and now you have some time. We have a lot of time now in between till I come in October to trouble you again. <laughs> so in this time, you all should decide what you are going to do, how are you going to help Sahaja Yoga, how you are going to work it out. This is very important because I don't need any Sahaja Yoga, you need it and all the rest of the world needs it. But despite that I am working so hard. So you have to think that Mother is now gone out, doesn't matter, we are going to work it out and we are going to find out what we can do about it. So please work out something till I come back 
I'll be back here again in October. Then we'll see what we can do and uh, achieve further. But let's see what you have achieved and bring them to some conclusions, bring them to some fruits. And that is what I'm expecting. Now I have to thank all the people who have done so much for Sahaja Yoga already and all the centers and all the countries where Sahaja Yoga started and is growing so much. I don't know if you know the names of all the leaders or not, but it is worth knowing all the leaders of all the countries and paying your attention to them and that praying that they should be uh, able to uh, deliver the blessings of Sahaja Yoga to everyone. Also, they should be able to have visions to see what they can do and how they can combine different countries and how they can work out through their own countries. So this is what it is. And I have to thank all the leaders of the world and all the people wherever I have been so far uh, for the arrangements and everything. They, did. they worked very hard and achieved such a lot of things. And I have to thank also the Sajogis who are with them, who have helped so much. Thank you very much, all of you. All right. In today's puja, we'll have first a Sri Ganesha's three mantras, and then we'll have uh, 108 names of Sri Krishna if they have. Have you got 108 names of Sri Krishna? Just watch my phone. Need not call the children now, they're very late. Don't need not call. You just pull.